Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Sorry for the slight delay. Ronan Farrow uh, has been a little delayed at the airport, uh, but he is en route. So we're going to uh, shuffle up the order a little bit um, and uh, introduce uh, a couple of uh, other measures, Plan B. First of all, I am David Walmsley. I am the chair of the Canadian Journalism Foundation, and I'm also the editor-in-chief of the Globe and Mail. And I extend a very warm welcome to all of you. It's an absolute pleasure to be here this evening, to have a sellout crowd, to spend a moment pausing and thinking about what journalism actually means in the 21st century. I think as an industry, we often don't do a good enough job of telling our own story. And tonight is a chance for us to make amends on that. This evening would not be possible without the support of Accenture, our generous sponsors who are with us thick and thin through various J Talks that we hold throughout the year. So thank you to them. As we wait for Ronan to wind his way through the Sunday traffic, I thought what we would do instead is I would play moderator and introduce you to someone who probably needs no introduction at all, but I'll give it a go. When I was appointed editor of the Globe and Mail, there was one name that I wanted to come to join us. And that was because it was a reporter who had a commitment and a determination to get the story no matter how sensitive or how difficult it was. It happened to be, at that time, the mayor of Toronto, and she was working for the Toronto Star. And Robin Doolittle was someone who had made it meteorically clear that the only thing that she wanted to do was the journalism of the highest quality with the best talent being used in the best way. So when I hired her into the Globe and Mail four years ago, her reticence included the fact that she didn't really know what this idea of a nebulous national story would be. What would it actually mean? How would it differ from where she had already been a great success at the Star? And I said, trust me, I want you to do journalism that is memorable, and I want you to take your time. And so what she did was she honed, I suppose, the holy trinity of modern journalism, which is to create journalism based on data. That data, secondarily, has to be then shared with the audience, because the audience is an important part of the story. And thirdly, it had to be memorable. And of course, out of that came the seminal global investigation unfounded, a look at tens of thousands of sex assault cases across Canada that the authorities had concluded had not resulted in a crime at all, but simply had not taken place. It was extraordinary work, and for 2017, it was the most awarded journalism in the English language anywhere in the world. So it gives me very great pleasure to welcome on stage the reigning Canadian National Journalist of the Year, Robin Doolittle. Hello. Isn't it so nice to come to an audience and you're like, we work at the Globe, and everyone's like, yeah! And like, you're a journalist, hooray! <laughs> Don't look at your phone, because it's a completely different <laughs> cesspool. I don't know, some, something there. How are no, you? No, it is. Uh, I'm very well. Good. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. How are you guys doing? Good. Did everyone buy Ronan's book in the front? Yeah. Well, he's not here. He can't hear you say no. <laughs> okay, great. So we're, we're going to spend a few minutes uh, talking until Ronan gets here. He is in the car, so it shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be too long. He's very close, like 10, 15 minutes. But it's Toronto traffic, so we thought we should probably come out. And your, your time will not be cut short, so yeah. it'll be all good. So, Robin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As you can tell, we've rehearsed this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the story of Unfounded, obviously, was something that you spent 20 months on. I think a lot of people in the audience will have a sense of that. But let's look back at it for a moment. Let's think about some of those moments and the, the sense of 
why it captured the imagination, not only because of the unimpeachable data you used, but why did it then go on to become such a powerful engine and, and drive so much of the news? You're a little bit out of it now. You're, yeah. Uh, you can uh, <laughs> um, I think Sinclair Stewart, our, our deputy editor, really summed it up best one day when we were discussing it after the fact. Um, the very beginning of Unfounded, uh, the genesis of it was the Gian Gomeshi trial. And so Gian Gomeshi's story broke in October 2014. Um, the following summer, I was really looking for my next project. David was giving me the big speech that you heard earlier about <laughs> big, national, take your time, which is just horrible words to hear when you've spent most of your career as a daily news reporter where you're writing three to five stories a week. Um, and uh, so I was just trying to think of what to do here, and Gian Gomeshi, everyone's obsessed with Gian Gomeshi, and I was just like sick of hearing about Gian Gomeshi, and, but it did get me thinking. Um, the prevailing thought at the time was the system is rigged against sexual assault victims, and this certainly felt uh, true, but I had no idea if it was true, and so we, uh, you know, I, I thought about how to go about, can you prove this from um, an investigative standpoint. And I initially thought I was going to do the, uh, the justice system. And I started looking into kind of the stats um, and realized there weren't stats and that the actual problem was at the gatekeepers to the justice system, the court system, was the police. And that was the genesis of Unfounded. And we ended up um, honing in on this one specific stat, this unfounded stat. Uh, an unfounded case is a case where the detective does not believe that the crime occurred. Um, that's different than there's not enough evidence to convict someone or we can't find the guy. This is, this is an invalid, false, baseless allegation. And what I found was that 20% of cases on average were being dis uh, dismissed in this way. And that was really key to me because um, so often when you hear uh, uh, you know, criticisms of the justice system, what you hear from law enforcement is the real problem is that people aren't reporting. And if more women and men would just report sexual assault, the system would be better. And what we found is that actually that was not the case. And so uh, getting back to Sinclair's comment that really summed this up per perfectly, um, the success of Unfounded was that it honed in on this one very specific, tangible thing trying to fix the justice system, how can you ever wrap your head around that? But if you focus on that one stat, that then you can build a bigger investigation, an anecdotal uh, investigation, and get into the specific stories, the human stories. Um, so I think that's what really resonated with people. But before you are able to have, I, I think one of the problems we face is that we live in this professional paradox. If you just take a newspaper, forget for a moment digital, a newspaper is delivered in seven foot snowdrifts, it's there at your home at 5.30 in the morning, and it looks perfect, or at least it should look pretty much smooth. The front page we have, for example, tomorrow, that we're just designing right now for the globe, is an inside look in a very remote province in China, where our correspondent in Beijing, Nathan Vanderklip, has gone and was tailed by seven different police op uh, operatives while he took photographs and is reporting as only the second person in the world on the mass re-education camps for the Uyghurs. Now that will look in the paper tomorrow, and it's probably rolling online shortly, as a kind of smooth piece. But I always think of that as similarly as I do to something that's a deep investigation. It doesn't just happen. <laughs> you have to commit to that sense of discovery. So were you surprised after it all ran that people listened to you in authority. Those who had never provided the documentation suddenly were prepared to give you the numbers. Oh, yeah, it was, um, so uh, this is just standard practice. Whenever you do a, a big investigation, you go to all the parties that are mentioned in the story, particularly people who um, you know, might not come out well uh, if you're making like an allegation against them, um, and you tell them exactly what you're gonna print, any questions you have, you give them an opportunity to respond. Um, I call them my due diligence emails. And I sent, it three months before the story ran, uh, every single police service, a full rundown of my story. Like, this is what this story is going to say at the beginning, in the middle, in the end. This is what your police service, this is what I'm saying about your police service. Because what we did with Unfounded was we created a database that anyone in the country could go look up their address and see what their police service was doing for sexual assault. 
This is what your police service's unfounded rate is. This is what it looks like in connection to the, the broader country. I asked, I was trying to get a sense of what the landscape looks like uh, with sexual violence and asked all these different police services what their staffing levels were like and none responded. Uh, like very few, like 10. And then suddenly the story runs, Prime Minister says we, we want action and within a week it was, um, it, it was a totally different story. It was shocking. Lovely. All right. I've got a signal from side stage. So, Robin, if you stay there, just a second. <laughs> Normal program. Look how we'll smooth resume. this is going, right? Okay. Does anyone need a stretch before we start? You want to stand up or? It was nothing. We're good. It, was, okay. it was nothing you said. Great. Okay. So, back to this evening. On behalf of the Canadian Journalism Foundation, uh, we honoured Ronan Farrow in 2018 with a special citation for courageous reporting that fueled a global movement against sexual harassment. He was recognised, quite rightly, for his New Yorker investigation exposing sexual harassment and assault allegations against the Hollywood film producer Harvey Weinstein and the complex web of people and systems that he used to cover up his acts. In a competitive lockstep with the New York Times, two groundbreaking pieces were published within a week of one another, one by Ronan and the other by Jody Cantor and Megan Toohey of the New York Times. The articles inspired a global social media movement. The three of them, both teams separately, awarded the Pulitzer Prize for public service journalism. And the many victims of sexual assault and harassment have now come forth with allegations about the sexual misconduct of other powerful figures, not only in entertainment, but across different industries. I'd like you to take just a second, queued up a video, please roll. I don't think we have to speculate about Ronan's future. Ronan's present is uh, uh, spectacular enough. I mean, this is a guy who before, at the age where I was learning to tie my shoes, Ronan was going off to college. Okay, he's been, uh, you know, a college graduate as a teenager. He is a Rhodes Scholar. He worked for Richard Holbrook at the State Department for years. Um, well, by the way, he went to Yale Law School. Uh, he had a television show. <laughs> so the fact that he's achieving something at the age of 29, 30 um, is thrilling to watch, but it's not entirely a shock. And I've never seen a reporter work harder than Ronan Farrow did. Thank you. This is, what, what am I going to put in this? The truth. The truth goes in the bowl. I'm so honored to be here and in such good company on stage. And I'm just immensely heartened every single time I go to another country and I see hardworking journalists trying, bang their head against the walls to expose the truth. We are in a time in which this profession is so embattled and there is so much authoritarian rhetoric directed against the pursuit of the truth and there's so much misdirection and brazen lying, and there is so much physical threat directed at journalists in so many parts of the world. A lot of what we may talk about today is just how tough it can get to break these investigative stories, but that pales in comparison to the journalists I profiled in various books and articles I've written in Pakistan, or in Belarus, or in so many places. Every Russian journalist who has tried to expose the military industrial complex there and died in the process. Every day I see these stories, and so what this award represents and what reporters around the world are doing, like Robin, is part of the solution. It's part of taking a stand against all that. So I'm just honored to be in this company, I'm honored to be here, and thank you each and every one of you for caring and for supporting that work. Oh, 
pleasure to be here. So you got to see Pearson Airport. I, I did. Uh, one of the interesting consequences of the Trump era is everyone there was telling me it's so much tighter now, security-wise. I can imagine they see your name and they're like, you definitely need to be here. I look like here. trouble. I literally went through three rounds of screening just now. Wow. Yeah. What did you did That seems you, like a great use of resources. They were all lovely. I mean, it yeah. is Canada. Did People it, are very polite. Did they bring <laughs> Did they bring you a Tim Hortons? Uh, they that would have been too Canadian. Right, right, right. Okay. But you know, they were extremely polite and very apologetic as they went through <laughs> doing a, a fine job of uh, of screening me. Yeah, yeah. And I I think what we've concluded is I'm not a threat. That's good. Right. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, Ronan, it is such an honor to have you here. I can say, you know, the journalism world in Canada is not huge. I get asked to do a lot of these things, a couple dozen a year maybe. I have never had my friends and family ask to come to something before. Are they here? Yeah, they're, like I swear, Hi, Robin's like, family. Like 50 people in my life have here. Yeah, I've, I've noticed none of you have come to other things, but I understand. So anyway, let's, uh, let's give these people what they're here for. Uh, we will try not to okay, disappoint, right. especially Harvey, your family. <laughs> uh, Harvey Weinstein. What can you tell me about what you remember of the first time that you heard rumors that Harvey Weinstein was harming women? Well, harming women is a very different matter than I think what many people equated Harvey Weinstein with, which is um, sort of generally scurrilous behavior. He uh, had a legendary temper. Um, he certainly, I think, was associated with sort of uh, transactional uh, sex, you know, that there casting were couch casting couch stuff. And, you know, I had, I had read stories about various actresses who made it onto magazine covers at a time when it seemed like it wasn't appropriate for their career, and he was said to have pulled the strings. Um, so in a sense, I had the same knowledge of Harvey Weinstein that anyone else who was peripherally aware of Hollywood in the States had. And it honestly wasn't until I started reporting the story that I saw something entirely different. What was it that like, made you think this is worth reporting? Like, do you remember that moment? Like, how did the, the investigation start? Well, there's a moment in every story, maybe you've experienced this yourself, where you kind of have wrapped your arms around the facts completely, and you can see the whole of it, and the patterns connect in a way where you realize it's real. Right. And there was certainly a point, uh, probably last summer, where that was the case. There were too many people telling me too many overlapping things, recounting two similar fact patterns independently of each other with too much evidence, uh, and it became apparent that this was something really important. And how do you go about taking on someone like Harvey Weinstein? Uh, well, in my case, I had to get fired and move out of my home, so <laughs> I, I don't know that I can provide much of a guidebook on that. Uh, I, you go for broke. and. I've talked a lot about how that looks sort of glamorous in retrospect when you have some sense that it's going to pay off, but at the time it's really just scary. And I, I wish I could say it was purely born of nobility. I think by the time I made that decision, it was sort of too late to go back. I had already burned all my bridges. Yeah. What well, can you, I mean, I, I, I think you gave a commencement address where you talked about that, and I just like, that was like one of the moments when we all fell in love with Ronan Farrow, I think, because that commencement address was just like, I want to put this on my fridge, because yes, I've been <laughs> there, I feel this. Can you, if people haven't read it, which you should read it, but tell, like, that's that moment when you're working on this and it's like, oh my God, this, what if this doesn't happen and yeah. I've invested so much? There was a moment uh, a little over a year ago where I was going from a meeting with one source to a meeting with another and I was in a cab and the context for this was uh, a book I had worked on for years and years had been dropped by the publisher. Um, I uh, didn't know if I would ever have another job in television and had been told that I was terminated at my current job after I refused to stop reporting this story I was working on. Uh, I was getting threatened. I was getting physical death threats. I had moved out of my home. Uh, I was not sleeping a lot. I was not eating a lot. Uh, and I had just learned that the Times had come in a couple months after me and, and started reporting this story, which was heartening in a lot of ways because I wanted the truth to get out, but also I had no idea what they had. And as it turns out, they had very different stuff. You know, they reported sexual harassment allegations. I ended up reporting the first sexual assault allegations. 
Uh, but I had no idea that that was going to be the case. And I really thought that there was a chance that I might just get scooped and no one would ever know I ever worked on it. And I remember being in this cab and just breaking down and like weeping openly. It was very As pathetic. As anyone would. As anyone would. That would be a horrible. So on the yeah. phone with my partner and he was like, all right, just calm down. We're going to talk about this. But also you really have to tip that cab driver. <laughs> it's like, tell him there's a death in the family. Yeah. <laughs> How, okay, so like when you're going and it, like tell people, because I think people are fascinated by that, like how are you structuring your days investigating this story? Like what do you do to investigate claims uh, that these sources were telling you? So I think there's been a little bit of a paradigm shift in our profession in the last couple of years. Um, sexual assault cases are not sui generis because you get this in murder cases too, but um, they're quite distinctive in that it's a, it's a rare type of criminal activity where very often the only surviving eyewitnesses are the participants. And, um, you know, so you have a, a person who's alleged to have committed a crime and you have a, a survivor of that crime. And there was, I think, a long-standing assumption that you just couldn't report that beyond this place of he said, she said, or he said, he said, or whatever. And I, I think that's for a long time in the legal system, not been the case. And I, my background is, is as an attorney. So I was aware in the case law of ways that people proved these things, um, or you know, as close as we can get in a legal context to proving them. Very often, particularly with a serial offender, um, you will have uh, mutually reinforcing fact patterns where numerosity can help shed light on, is there an MO here? Uh, very often, even if there is no one else in the room, there's a category of people who see the alleged survivor immediately afterwards and uh, witness the aftermath as it's happening, uh, you know, hear the, the recitation of the fact pattern while it's still emotional and fresh. And that's not considered hearsay in American law. Um, you know, that's not just a standard, oh, someone got told afterwards. That's that's prompt outcry is the, the legal term. So one of the things I was able to impress upon people as I reported the story was there are these ways you can prove it. Um, Harvey Weinstein also, and this is I think typical of reporting these kinds of cases when it specifically relates to powerful people, had a paper trail. So you had settlement after settlement uh, and as I was able to obtain a lot of that documentation, it became apparent that you really could put together a body of evidence that was very persuasive. Yeah, and using those settlements, which usually have silenced people to your advantage. Well, a, a, right, exactly. So while a settlement is certainly not legally proof of any kind of crime, I think when you have a pattern of settlements, um, and it's very apparent because some of them are sloppily written what they're referring to, what they're trying to cover up. Uh, you know, if, if you have a, for instance, one of the contracts that we obtained, it's a million dollar settlement uh, that calls for the complete destruction of all of the uh, possible evidence, any recordings of a specific window of, you know, during X hours, if anything was recorded, you're obligated to destroy it. You have to turn over your phone and all your social media accounts to this private investigation firm. They're going to wipe all of your devices. Um, you know, that suggests someone is probably trying to right. not disclose what happened during those hours seems on that shady. day. Seems shady. <laughs> right. Yes. This is not the kind of contract any of us normally signs. Uh, so these aren't just generic NDAs, in other words. They were, they were written in a way that gave a lot of information. And none of those pieces in and of themselves is dispositive, but uh, together they create something really powerful. You talked about a shift in our profession uh, relating to these, these uh, stories being reported at all. But one other thing that I've, I've seen a shift in our profession um, and, and heard you talk about this as well, which is really interesting. I think there used to be this kind of old idea around journalism and source relationships. Like I'm the journalist and you're the source and you're just going to, I'm in, totally in charge and I'm just going to take all your facts and it's mine and too bad. I think uh, you Is that your Twitter bio? It is, actually, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take too all your bad. facts. Take your facts and too bad. Um, yeah, but I, I think especially when you're reporting on, on something as, as horrible and raw as a sexual assault, you, you do develop relationships um, with your sources. And it can be sometimes hard to keep that professional distance um, while also maintaining trust and, um, and the integrity of the story. Uh, I can imagine that that's something like that you dealt with a lot. Like, how did you balance that? 
Yeah, I, it's, there was a funny moment. I collaborated on two stories this past year with Jane Mayer, who's one of our great living Amazing. American investigative reporters, um, who, who mostly had dealt with uh, uh, sort of financial journalism type sources, national security sources, um, over a very long career of incredible uh, stories. And it was very much new territory for her when we did this story about a very powerful Democrat, Eric Schneiderman, to deal with people who were so um, emotionally raw all the time. And it can be very draining. And I remember having these conversations where she's like, do you know how to deal with this? You know, Because it, it can be um, all consuming. And, and fair enough, you know, I, I have a tremendous amount of compassion for the fact that when someone does this extraordinary brave thing of deciding they want to talk about something, and, and do so in a way where it pits them against a very powerful person. Um, their, their nerves are shredded all the time. They're often reliving the worst moment of a lifetime, re-experiencing trauma. And what that can translate into is, you know, you're doing your reporting, but also there's someone who almost wants um, like a therapeutic relationship. You know, they want to just talk, they want to be heard. And, and that doesn't go away after a story either. Um, you know, I periodically will hear from sources that, you know, I've worked with on a story a year ago or more, and they'll just call and they'll be, they'll just want to talk. You know, I had, there was a, there was a wonderful uh, woman who was a, a source in the story I did about Les Moonves, Phyllis Golden Gottlieb. She is 82 years old. Um, she is the most remarkable woman, like still leads, a, leads such a, a vibrant, diverse life. Um, you know, goes to see music, lives on her own, has her friends, uh, but she'll like she'll call me every few days, and just say every like every few days, yeah, and just say like <laughs> hi, how's it going? Like what's going on? And I love hearing from her, you know. But I'll be in the middle of ten different things, and I really I do always try to sit down and like give her the time because she gave me the time and she didn't have to. Yes. Um, and she'll just say, I mean, this is a lovely version of what you get because she's not in a bad place emotionally about it. She'll just say, she, one, one time she said, I, I don't want to lose you, oh. which is a very moving thing for a reporter to hear. But you're, you're also right that um, you know, there can be less in the aftermath like that, but more when you're in the heat of a story, an uncomfortable tension where I actually have to explain sometimes to sources I'm working with, you know, I, I am so grateful for what you're doing here, but also this is going to feel adversarial sometimes. Yes. I'm going to be stress testing your claims. Uh, I'm going to be, you know, digging into every possible re response that people could throw at you um, to try to impugn your credibility. Uh, and that's not always going to feel like a friendship. Yeah, I found that in, in my own reporting, just that explaining of, um, you know, like I am a journalist, I'm not an activist, I'm not going to write. I believe survivors yes. in a story, and, and I'm doing you no favors by not rigorously investigating um, your claims. Uh, I'm so happy to hear you say that because you know I, I have a lot of conversations like this that are not with fellow journalists and um, have been honored to, to sit on stage with some great activists, people like Tarana Burke who created the Me Too hashtag and has done all this wonderful community organizing and is a fantastic human being. Um, and she kind of teases me that I'm such a stickler for I'm all constantly pointing out like I, I don't subscribe to the believe all survivors or believe all women school of thought. Um, I subscribe to a listen to all survivors, listen to the facts, listen to all women. You're gonna steal that. That's, that's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I think the greatest justice that you can do to these kinds of claims and, and to difficult newsworthy claims in general, not just about sexual violence, is listen to them. Listen to them even if they come from the most marginalized corners of our community, even if they're about hard truths that we haven't confronted for a long time. And as you point out, the, the best sort of journalism you can do, the best bolstering of these claims, doesn't involve advocacy. And, and how do you deal with that? I mean, interesting you said that, because I deal with the same thing, where you, you get in these kind of push and pulls with, uh, with activists. Uh, I found some of the biggest backlash to my series was from within the advocacy com community, which is just, it's a really interesting dynamic. What do you do with, like, when you explain to people, I'm a journalist, not an activist? Or are you an activist? No, I'm not. I, I've, I've given that exact quote. I, I really think it's an important distinction. Um, and I, I find it very frustrating, actually, that certainly in the States, and I, I see versions of this around the world, I, I don't know if this is true in the Canadian context, you all would know better, there is a shrinking space for that kind of 
I won't even say down the middle because that implies some kind of a false equivalence, but that kind of blinders on just the facts, ma'am. Like, mm -hmm. you care about the truth and you don't really care about the impact other than being passionate about exposing the truth. Um, and people often just don't understand that in the current climate. You know, I, I'll do a story about a powerful Democrat. Most of my stories have been about powerful Democrats. And as much as people are skeptical of it, that's not because they're Democrats, you know? And I, I get all the hate mail saying, you know, oh, you're a, you're a Trump plant. And you know, one of those guys that I mentioned was you know, a big opponent of, of Trump's. He was pursuing all these legal cases against Trump. Uh, and then he was gone. And people weren't happy with me. Then I do a story about a Republican, and people, you know, there's the whole like Russian troll farm that spins up, and I've got all these like MAGA hat wearing kind of <laughs> avatars that don't really seem like they're real people. They got like three followers and a bald eagle in their banner, and people you want to hang out with. It's sure, my yeah. best friends, yeah. and, and they're like, you know, die in a fire, get cancer. They're <laughs> lovely, lovely people, uh, and I, I think that. Some of that really is like algorithmically generated mm -hmm. fakery, but, but also uh, there are people out there who really passionately believe that everything slots into this partisan warfare, that it's all about that. And everything gets thrown into this cauldron of mistrust and the environment I was talking about where the media is so attacked and embattled um, and people don't really understand that there is still this thing we're talking about of just pursuing the truth so people can make up their own minds about it. I think they hear pursuing the truth, and they're like, la, 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 like a left wing media party. Um, right, right. <laughs> do the Twitter trolls get to you? Yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, I, I've basically just removed myself from it and have stopped looking because it's, uh, it's so dehumanizing every time that gets spun up against you. Um, it's weird as a journalist because you don't think of ne yourself necessarily as a public figure. Yeah. Well, you kind of are, I guess. I don't know. But like, and then you're just eviscerated constantly on social media and I, yeah. Yes, and, and that's it's totally become, against me, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you said that. It's, uh, it's really brutal and, and really counterproductive because it is specifically designed to ward us off of stories that people don't like. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I think it's gone from being just uh, a side effect of certain platforms having a degree of anonymity like Twitter and a degree of brevity where it encourages that kind of dialogue where... Die like, in a fire, really... Cool. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. That's all that fits. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not like even a Facebook which has its own problems or an Instagram where it's more about who you are, it's tied to your real identity, you're showing yourself theoretically with most profiles you see. Um, Twitter is, is deeply anonymized and really, I think, uh, gives new life to the guy who would otherwise be just sort of slurring words at the corner of the bar at closing time. In his mom's basement. Or in his mom's basement, right. Um, uh, possibly in his mom's basement, uh, <laughs> developing a fake private investigation firm <laughs> to smear Robert Mueller. <laughs> But, but it's now evolved into something that I think is still more dangerous, which is uh, a highly organized uh, set of institutions that deploy the trolls. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there is now a whole parallel universe for the right and for the left that isn't interacting beyond that. It's just like they see the, the flag and then there's a swarm of what you're describing. Some of it fake, some of it very obviously not real people, um, and some of it driven by these extremists who are goading this all on. Yeah, and I think this is interesting because we're in an area now of this, the, politi uh, like the politics and journalism and what side we're on or whatnot and the attacks. And I, one thing that I thought was really interesting after your Brett Kavanaugh story, um, uh, the Deborah Ramirez, uh, this is the second Kavanaugh accuser story, um, yeah, I we thought... broke the first story about Christine Ford's allegation, the yeah. letter, and the contents of it, and then we broke the first uh, story about Ramirez. Yeah, and I'd love to hear about that, how that came to, yeah. to be. But I was also interested, just on this politics side, I saw some on the left saying, like, okay, sure, this is probably true, but you shouldn't have broken it because it undermined the focus on Blasey Ford, uh, as if it's kind of the, your job to to keep a campaign of pressure on Kavanaugh. Yeah. And it I mean, you just have to ignore that. I, don't, I didn't see a lot of commentary to that effect. I saw a lot of right-wing commentary saying, you know, this is all made up, and Ford has no corroboration, and Ramirez has no corroboration. Ramirez especially 
had an extraordinarily high degree of corroboration for this kind of sexual assault claim. So can you tell us about like the beginning of it? Because it was an interesting yeah. story, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we had heard, I had heard specifically um, about Ford's claim going back to July uh, and had talked to some people in her orbit and she was actively considering, they, the, Ramirez and, and uh, Ford had very different trajectories. Ford was actively considering trying to get word out about her story in some way. Um, Ramirez asked for none of it. Uh, you know, it was a widely retold story in her class, and so other people in her Yale class spun up all of the stories right. about it and, it, and it landed on the Hill, and then it was being investigated. Right. Um, at which point, it inarguably was a huge news story that we had mm. to cover. Um, the, the Ford claim disappeared for a long time because uh, an American Democrat that she went to uh, basically covered it up. I mean, I think considered it, I think there was probably a generational attitudinal difference there, considered it to be not worthy of dialogue. Oh, do you think that that's what, that's interesting? I mean, that's certainly what staffers on the Hill said, that, that the dialogue behind the scene, well, we, we quote people yeah, to that effect yeah. in this first story about Ford, um, that basically no one could figure out why this wasn't brought forward. And there was sort of a canard that was offered by the Democrats of, uh, uh, oh, we, we were respecting her, anon her anonymity, but very clearly it would have been possible to respect her anonymity and also do something about it. Question Launch, him in private or something. Question him in private, yes. send it to the FBI. None of that happened until there was public pressure. Mm. Um, so that very clearly, I think, uh, was a great disservice to her. And then by the time it came forward, there was this political firestorm ongoing and this race instigated by the other side, by the right, to the finish line where they were just rushing, rushing, rushing. And then when uh, Ramirez's claim made its way to the Hill and was being investigated, they actually tried to accelerate the timeline. Uh, and, and I know that there's been some contention about Ford's witnesses and that she couldn't necessarily come up with people who would go on the record saying that they were there. Um, but Ramirez especially had I mean, witnesses up to and including a guy who saw her crying right afterwards and recounting the fact pattern and went on the record to say so. Mm -hmm. um, it was very clearly a situation that merited a more thorough investigation. And they and other sources who were out there, I think, would have been uh, well served by a slower, more methodical timeline. And honestly, Brett Kavanaugh would have been better served by a slower, more methodical timeline where the FBI actually looked at these claims. And obviously that didn't happen. On the second story, what was so interesting about it is, you know, Ford had a clear memory, mm -hmm. but didn't necessarily have the, the witnesses that would go on record to back her up. Right. Ramirez, initially, was not 100% sure, and then she, I think you quoted that she, you know, she took some time to think about it. Yeah. But there was, a, a multi, there was much more evidence outside of that to back it up. Right. So how do you as a journalist um, uh, kind of tackle that story, which is not as, as straightforward? Although by that point, a, a huge matter of public interest given what's happening. Yeah, I, I think that the answer is, and this is the approach we took, you disclose every possible question mark. And this is the business of not being an advocate. And sometimes that makes everyone on both sides unhappy. But you've got to say, here are all the possible reasons for skepticism. And also, here's the pretty considerable amount of evidence that suggests that this woman is telling the truth. Mm -hmm. The New York Times seemed a little bit grumpy that you guys broke that story. They, they were a little competitive about it. <laughs> um, and to his immense credit, you know, uh, Dean Becquet, who is a personal hero of mine, ran around for you know four days making it very clear like this that he had no questions about the story it was just that they got beaten in the race to get this interview um but you saw in that incredibly pressurized climate how the partisans just ran with what she's referring to as the times actually after a number of my stories <laughs> have run sort of paragraphs saying you know we made calls about this um and it's sort of, it's like an endearing Times thing. Like, they're, it's the New York Times. They're, they're incredible. Um, you know, they're the great paper of record. And I think at times when they're in an arms race for a story, they feel the need to say afterwards, like, we tried. We got close. Schneiderman, they did the same thing. Yeah. Jen, Jen had a uh, great tweet that I'll read. Please do. Funny. 
New York Times is best paper around, but if Ramirez had talked to them on the record and they'd found a classmate who heard the identical story at the time and they knew Congress was investigating and she wanted the FBI to come in, the chance they wouldn't publish is zero. Yeah, and, and a lot of love. Dean said as much, which, which was great of them. And the reason he had to say that is by that time, their paragraph saying, you know, we made calls about this and we couldn't get the interview um, had transmogrified into Mitch McConnell and Ted Cruz and all these people. Donald Trump was railing on, you know, she's drunk, she's messed up. Um, they all sort of descended on this woman and attacked her. And one of the talking points that they weaponized was, you know, well, the Times said they couldn't get, they couldn't get an interview with her. You know, they couldn't get this story. So therefore, you know, this is, this is shady. Um, we, and the time, you had this, this is a perfect illustration of the culture of falsehoods that we live in in the United States and in politics in particular right now. We had on the one hand the editor of the New York Times running around saying like, not true, yes. never passed on this story, never rejected in any way. And then, you know, Ted Cruz and Mitch McConnell saying, saying the New York Times rejected this story. They reported it out. It wasn't supported. And in fact, the New York Times actually then went and ran their reporting on it. They ran a long piece that was very sympathetic to Ramirez and laid out a lot of evidence in her favor. Um, but you know, once you have a false political talking point out there, we are in an environment where it just has a life of its own. And no I love when what the New York Times says. Yeah, I love when Republicans are like, but the New York Times didn't do it. Because I love the New York Times, except when I hate the New York Times. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Um, I wanted to talk about your book. Uh, and I have it under my, I'm not going to bend over, because that's going to go on Twitter or something. But um, <laughs> I had it out earlier. I won't go down there and get it either, you because could, that, yeah, would, that, that would, would also, also end, on Twitter. <laughs> end up on Twitter. Okay. Um, writing a book uh, is just like the most torturous exercise in the world. And I really would not wish it on my worst enemy. Yeah, it's horrible. And you're writing another one now yeah. while doing all of these things yeah. and taking down like well, saving America and I, I think doing like finishing your PhD, finished your PhD? I have submitted it. Do I need to defend to it next month. Wish me luck. <laughs> Thank you. I have a feeling you're going to be OK. I hope so. Imagine they were like, no Ronan Farrow. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they're great over there. I'm doing a, a PhD at Oxford. Um, and Get this guy. <laughs> the, it, it's a, a wonderful, magical Harry Potter place. Uh, and you really like, I will have to wear my robes and everything to, to defend. Uh, and they really, like, I don't think they care what's going on here with us in Canada and the United States. Is that a nice feeling that, like, they don't care about you? It's a little bit so, like, there was this week where... I'm really off topic of your I br I filed three stories about the Kavanaugh thing. Uh, I uh, had a bunch of speeches I had to give to, like, important groups doing wonderful work this same week. Um, and I had to submit my 350-page PhD. Uh, and it was all due at once. And I did, like, I called the Oxford administrators, and I was like, hi, I'm Ronan. I'm a student at Maudlin. They have these colleges. I'm in Maudlin <laughs> College. Uh, and they all look like Hogwarts. <laughs> I, and I said, you know, hey, I, there's just, like, there's kind of, there's an emergency situation <laughs> with this breaking news story. And there was this long pause, and they're like, you know, we, we've been here a 1,000 years, so <laughs> we don't care that your country is a dumpster fire. <laughs> you never should have left the crown. Yeah. You know, there's still a little bit of that, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, ah, OK. So this, you know, they required that a hard copy be bound and delivered to a magnificent crumbling ruin by such and such a time. Did Just you take like your deadline? like they've been doing it. I did. I what a good deadline. journalist. I got it in like an hour before deadline. Amazing. It only took six years. <laughs> I used to submit my papers when I was in university. Uh, if I wasn't done, I would purposely like not print out the last half of it and just submit it. And then later be like, I just realized the last half of my <laughs> Did anyone actually fall for that? Everyone fell for that. <laughs> Every time. You can use that. OK. Um, but back to my initial point was writing a book is a torturous <laughs> exercise. Um, your book is about your time at the State Department. Yes. Because in addition to all your other things, you were at the State Department. Um, and uh, 
what was the story that you felt needed to be told? And it's a, it's a fabulous book. There's Warlords with Reindeer. Um, I'm glad you caught that. I did. I have an actual question about that later on, too. But uh, you should definitely get it just for the Warlord with the Reindeer. And were there sharks? There were sharks. Like, th think about that. Sharks and warlords. It was like a James Bond villain's lair. And Liberace, I think, is what you're. I, I compared him to uh, to Liberace by way of a Bond villain. This is General Dostum, uh, famous mass murdering, horseback, uh, sword wielding Uzbek warlord. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna. I have a question about him, and I'm glad you said his name because I was trying to ask you the pronunciation beforehand. But the traffic, I was like, well, I'm, I don't want to embarrass myself by saying just Okay. Now you know. Now I know. Anyway, um, what was it about like this essential story that that you felt needed to be told that you were going to go through the horrible process of writing a book for? Well, we're in an interesting moment now, and the book has kind of come onto people's radars a few months after it came out. Again, because of this conversation that we're all having about Saudi Arabia. The book is about the militarization of American foreign policy. And there are two phenomena that I talk about that sort of contribute to that. One is we're firing all our diplomats. We're denigrating the profession. This has been true under a number of administrations because it's not sexy to say, hey, we want to put resources into these bureaucrats who actually make these essential deals and negotiate our way out of war and prevent us from shooting first. Um, people don't understand that work. There aren't movies about that work. And so on the campaign trail, both Democrats and Republicans have really promised to cut back on that. And, and when we do, it leaves us flat-footed in various conflicts. So I profile how much worse that's gotten under the Trump administration and um, have these wonderful diplomats that I tell the stories of, including one who is accused of being a spy because nobody understands what Her diplomats name's Robin. do. Robin. Great name. Another great Robin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, complicated Robin, that one. Yeah. Uh, but she was a fascinating person to profile, and I had worked with her in Pakistan. Uh, she was not a spy, as it turns out. Uh, but, you know, there are some gray areas there that you should read the book and learn about. The, the other side of the militarization that we're seeing in America's posture around the world is, uh, you know, we centralize power at the White House. We give authority to generals, often to the exclusion of civilians. And what you wind up with is... Uh, I think I say at one point in the book, you know, we, we've changed who we bring to the table, and therefore it's changed who comes to the table at the other side as well. So we're bringing more generals to the table and this more militarized posture, and so the resultant relationships are more militarized. And I profile all these cases around the world where we have kind of made dirty deals with bad guys because it's, it's militarily expedient. And General Dostum, after 9-11, is a great example of that. You know, we were brand new to this completely new global landscape, um, this completely new national security state, uh, and these new exigencies security-wise that had kind of given the, the Bush administration carte blanche in terms of these relationships. And that was a case where basically while the slow-moving bureaucrats on the civilian side were still deciding what to do, the CIA and the Pentagon swept in, and they just started giving guns to the bad guys on the ground, because the, the logic was your, your enemy's enemy is your friend, and these guys were willing to fight the Taliban. And what's complicated about it is they did kind of affect some successes right off the bat. They did topple the Taliban, but the case I make here, and that's why I was hanging out with the reindeer and the sharks, uh, is that that ultimately really came back to bite us. And we see this story play out over and over again. And I think people are just awakening now because of this very personal, very individual story of what happened to Khashoggi. Um, people now are seeing how dangerous it is to lie down with the worst people in the world, um, you know, and the most dangerous military regimes in the world. And that's very much the, the thrust of the book. When you were going to this warlord's house and you're there to ask him about a mass grave that he doesn't want to talk about, that no country wants to talk about, including your own, are you afraid? Like, why did you do that? <laughs> That's what my mom said, yeah. too. Like, I'm like, hey, I'm in Kabul. Why? <laughs> Come you back. Kabul going to see a warlord? Or, yeah. I kind of kept that vague until afterwards. Yeah. Uh, was she upset afterwards? She was, she was a little concerned about that. <laughs> Our moms get concerned when we hang out with yeah. warlords. It happens. Parents. Yeah. Classic moms. <laughs> the, 
I used as a prism through which to view the broader chaos that the warlords we supported have wrought on Afghanistan, this case that you mentioned of a, an unsolved murder mystery, basically a mass grave in Afghanistan uh, that had been covered up by first the Bush administration and really then the Obama administration too. They promised an investigation, they, they didn't do it, and then they did it on the sly secretly and like buried the results, and it was all very fishy. Um, and really the guy in question, the guy accused of killing these thousands of prisoners, uh, had never answered tough questions about it because of that. So I figured, you know, if I'm posing this question of what's the fallout from these relationships, might as well go ask him. Uh, Were and you I was nervous to ask to be able that to. question? Like, what if he cuts my head off? With I oh yeah, I mean, I describe a, a moment in this book where he kind of, one of his sons who's in training to be a, a general himself, uh, kind of steps forward and he's got like an M13, I think, on his chest and kind of grips it a little more tightly. D General Dostum actually made a warlord joke at one point <laughs> where he's like, you know, the, the Russians betrayed me and the Americans betray me and this is, I just asked sort of a tough question about this and he sort of leans in and his like armed guys kind of step forward behind him. He's like, I hope you will not betray me. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I will not. <laughs> trying to figure out how you respond diplomatically to this. Look about diplomacy. Uh, and he, then he sort of, he waits a beat for comedic timing and then says, you know, I'm talking about the schedule. You're taking too long. Like, you said 20 minutes. It's now been 25. You betrayed my schedule. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. And yeah, he he's a funny guy. <laughs> Nobody tweet that because that'll, anyway. Um, the, the book is really about this, I, I think, part of the takeaway is the, the decline of American influence in the world. If you're pulling out of all, all your diplomats, if you're not engaged in the diplomatic discussion. And I guess the question, so you have you know, the soon to be not chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel saying, we cannot rely on the United States to protect yeah. Europe. Um, does it matter? that the United States' influence has, has shrunk? Do, you, do we need the United States to protect us? It's a question Canada I grapple does, with in the, in the book. I mean, yes, Canada does, but honestly, the, the world does too. We're, first of all, we're, we are, I think, too big to fail. It's really bad for everything, everyone and everything if the United States goes under in some way. Mm -hmm. um, the United States becoming a wanton and reckless military power is bad for everyone. Uh, the United States becoming uh, protectionist and isolationist economically is bad for everyone in addition to being bad for Americans. Uh, we're too connected for it not to matter. I also think from a global standpoint, you have to think about who's filling that void. And you know, I'm, I'm careful not to demonize the idea of like Russia's ascent or China's ascent, and I don't want to conflate those two things. They both have very different implications. but. I do think we're at a moment in history where Chinese leadership will bring a very different set of ethics and priorities to a lot of places in the developing world where the United States is now pulling out and doesn't even have ambassadors a lot of the time. And China is doubling down and investing heavily and really showing leadership. I, I think that we should all, anyone who cares about human rights and peace and progress should think carefully about what that change means. And you touched on this a little earlier, just talking about that, that kind of human rights dilemma. Um, is it possible, like so much of the book is about kind of American, um, mil the American, American military choosing actions that ultimately undermine its broader goal. Um, you know, you talk about um, uh, alliances with, with Pakistan's intelligence agency, fighting yes. the Taliban. Um, are, are these miscalculations or are these arrangements just totally unavoidable in foreign policy? Well, I, I have a very sober tone in the book where my proposal is not like we have to cut off all these relationships or even to propose that that's possible. You're absolutely right that a lot of these entanglements are necessary evils to some extent, but I do think we self-sabotage by um, going for those relationships too quickly and too thoughtlessly and not extricating from them at times where we, we can sooner. And, and one of the lessons I hope comes through in the book is there are solutions to this. You can pull out of these toxic relationships sooner. You can play hardball more aggressively and I profile cases where that's worked 
um, even in the context of these difficult relationships like our relationship with Pakistan, like our relationship with Egypt, I, I try to find the individual policy changes that have actually worked and stuck it to them and maybe helped us increase our leverage so that we can avert a crisis. We can stop them when they are killing civilians. Mm -hmm. the, the book, um, your, your affection uh, and admiration for um, Richard Holbrook is just really woven throughout the whole book, um, and I'll, I'll. But you didn't gloss over his rougher edges. No. <laughs> I'm going to read this this passage, which I just really loved. Um, he wrote voluminously and had the uncanny ability to speak in crisp, complete paragraphs. As oblivious as he could be to the sensitivities of people around him, he was a detail observer of the world and an indomitable in his excitement about it. In other words, he was the rare asshole who was worth it. Yeah, he what, was. What, what was it like writing about someone you were so close with, um, and especially to not just kind of gloss over uh, the, the rougher edges? Well, he was dead when I was writing. <laughs> so I didn't really have to think about what he would think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I just tried to be honest, as I always do in my writing. And there's a lot of complicated portraits of complicated people in this book. and. No one is black and white, and he, he was a jerk a lot of the time to a lot of people, but he also was an extraordinary mentor, and he stood for a kind of true patriotism, and that's a term that gets beaten up a lot these days, but he really was someone who believed in public service and believed in serving his country and believed in this sort of dying art of diplomacy as a tool for change. Um, and so I thought he, his was an important story to tell, warts and all. Can you tell us about the, your job interview with him, which is a really fun section of the book? Yeah, the chapter is called The Shower Scene. <laughs> he took me uh, to interview at, I arrived at the State Department for my job interview, and um, he very graciously, I think, in a show of his sort of um, wonderful flair for theater and also his wonderful qualities as a mentor, you know, took me up to the Secretary of State and had me interview with her. I had no business interviewing with the Secretary of State. I was, you know, applying for this very junior job. And um, uh, then at, was sort of barking policy hardball questions at me as we went from the State Department um, to his townhouse in Georgetown as he packed for a, a trip that he was going on. Um, and then hopped into the shower, like behind an ajar door, but was like, you know, oh no, I'm just keep answering questions. Took a shower while asking me about, you know, negotiations with the Taliban and branding USAID assistance. Um, and that was Richard Hallberg. Just about everyone had a story about him enthusiastically and obliviously following them into a bathroom. Hillary Clinton would tell this story all the time, you know. And then he followed me into a ladies' room in Pakistan, she'd say. <laughs> she loved that story. Um, he just he didn't, he wasn't aware of his surroundings. He was always doing this like Aaron Sorkin rapid dialogue, like not looking around him. Did any part of you, like when he was in the shower, think like, I gotta get out of here? No, no, I mean, this was pre Me Too, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't occur to me. <laughs> Throughout the book, there's this, this tug of war, but tug of war, haha, <laughs> military, between the military and the State Department. Um, and Holbrook at one point says, like, his job should be to drop the bombs when I tell him. And then there's also this acknowledgement that the State Department isn't perfect either and has, you know, its bureaucracy. What do you think is the right division between military and diplomacy, this, this talk or might? Well, we are a civilian-led government. Um, and I, I think you need both of those sides of the United States foreign policy apparatus uh, and the intelligence community, which is some, also something different and also has its pros and cons. There are brave public servants risking a lot in each of these branches of government, and there's a reason we have in the states this system of checks and balances, and, and that should be reflected in the policy conversations in the White House, too. I think a, a well-oiled, highly functioning NSC, the National Security Council at the White House, gives equal time to these different perspectives. But that is almost impossible to achieve. There's very little American history where that's actually what it's looked like. I mean, by and large, the Pentagon is always going to be vastly more resourced. And the peril is um, that that creates an environment where there isn't just 
more time given to the voices from the Pentagon, but all the time given over to that. So 50-50? 50-50 would be great. 50-50 would be real progress right now. And, and I think, you know, that this can all sound very kind of internal and inside baseball and who's in the room and who's This is the right talking. crowd. They want the This is a smart crowd, yeah. so you guys care. But it, this also affects lives around the world. I mean, th this is why we end up in these unchecked alliances with dictators and strongmen. And um, when we disempower our diplomats and have a president who is constantly sort of calling up these strong men and saying they're fantastic and wonderful and amazing, um, it sends a signal around the world. It gives carte blanche to dictators who are cracking down on journalists and cracking down on dissidents. It's really bad, it's really dangerous. Um, one of the most powerful, I think, moments in the book is when John Kerry comes out to announce the Iran deal. Um, another example of a flawed, mm -hmm. a flawed maybe deal with the devil, um, but necessary. Uh, and he talks about his own military history in Vietnam, and he says, I learned in war the price that is paid when diplomacy fails, and I made a decision that if I ever was lucky enough to be in a position to make a difference, I would try to do so. I know that war is the failure of diplomacy and the failure of leaders to make alternate decisions. Um, you come away from this book feeling like, uh, at least in the, new in the near future, there are opportunities for di diplomacy, uh, but they're being gutted. And we know what happened with the Iran deal in the end. So, I mean, are you optimistic going forward? I, I certainly wouldn't have written this book if I thought it was a eulogy to diplomacy and this was all in the past tense. I think, uh, to some extent, this goes in cycles. I think that, uh, there are great examples of turnaround jobs, particularly in the middle of a two-term uh, presidency. The Obama administration uh, really succumbed to an overly militarized process in a number of critical foreign policy crises that I profile in this book, and then in the second term, deliberately course corrected. And I have some of his aides saying that that's what they did. Um, and you wound up very rapidly with real diplomatic achievement. I mean, this doesn't take decades to just get some settlements negotiated that can avoid con conflict. You know, you had in the second Obama term, um, after them really, really giving over Afghanistan and a number of other situations to the generals over the objections of people like Richard Holbrook. You then had the Iran deal, the thaw in relations with Cuba, uh, the Paris Climate Change Accord, that all happened really rapidly with only a couple of years of investment in, okay, we're gonna double down on diplomacy. That can happen again is one of the big lessons of the book. Mm -hmm. You interviewed every living Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Did anyone give you a hard time? Did you have to twist anyone's arm or they're all like, I like that Ronan. She's baiting like me, she knows the answer. Yeah, Hillary Clinton was really difficult. And I'd worked with her for years and uh, you know, have a lot of respect for her legacy in a lot of ways. Uh, and had a close personal relationship with her, but she also had a very close personal relationship with Harvey Weinstein, and um, you know her folks had reached out to me and uh, expressed some concern about that uh, before they tried to cancel that interview. To her credit, she, uh, you know, he was a big Democratic donor, so for years had been a big Hollywood bundler for the Clintons. Uh, to her credit, she did then get on the phone and go on the record for this book, but I think you know, it was uh, brief and perfunctory after I noted that they had uh, expressed those concerns about Weinstein in a not off the record context and uh, that I would be writing a book that had every living Secretary of State but one and then a pretty strange explanation for why I didn't have that one. <laughs> so. So she, she did talk, and I, I, I know from having worked for her at the State Department for a number of years that she cares passionately and earnestly about the institutions of diplomacy. Um, and you know I, I think there are some areas where she did fine work as a Secretary of State. Um, and I think she is a committed public servant, uh, but very wrapped up in these political concerns. And if you compare you know someone like John Kerry, who, who I didn't work for and didn't have a personal relationship with, you know, his comments and the degree of candor that he had and the degree of passion he had as opposed to what she says in this book. It is, it's a very striking difference. And, and even, um, you know, some of the kind of unexpected voices like Schultz, you know, mm. this, these sort of ancient 
uh, Republicans. Like real that, ancient, like, like how zooms ancient yeah. to. There's a couple who are in their 90s. I mean, Schultz, uh, Schultz is what, 97 maybe? Um, uh, Kissinger is 94. Uh, like what was Kissinger like? Like he doesn't seem like a super friendly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Canadian, I can say that, so. K Maybe Kissinger, you can also. Uh, you know, I, I confront head on in, in the book that you know he's regarded by many serious scholars of war crimes to be a, a war criminal, um, right. and uh, all the ways in which his reputation is extremely divisive. Um, and he is not happy when you turn the subject to that. By the way, he does not like answering questions about that. He tried to stop that interview. All of that said, uh, you know, and, and this is not uh, an apology for any of the bad things he did, any of the Cambodia stuff, I think that should be mentioned every time his name comes up. Um, but there's just no way around it. He is also a dazzling intellect mm. and speaks in this book frankly and with tremendous insight. Um, and talks a lot about how the State Department is empty. And he, he's, it's odd, he sort of renders the problem exactly as the book renders the problem, but is then less concerned about it. He's like, ah, something new will come along to replace that. Yeah. But, but he also, he had a framing which really stuck with me. I think it's the, I, I use it as the end of the first chapter. Um, he said, in the context of new administrations coming in and not wanting to do this kind of careful old school diplomacy, and more specifically in the context of Richard Holbrook, who was someone who represented uh, an old-fashioned form of influence exchanging and sparring, uh, and who literally had a set of relationships that were from the past. You know, he'd been in politics for decades and, and really ran aground during the Obama administration with a set of younger, newer players who just wanted to house clean and get rid of all these old Clintonites. Um, Kissinger said in that context, it's one great American myth that you can always try something new. And I thought that was such a fascinating idea. And it's so often true in politics and so often the root of a lot of problems. We are just winding down here before I'm gonna to go to audience questions, but I, I obviously need to ask you about Me Too. Um, Me Too, I mean, so much, especially in the journalism context, we talk about, um, you know, is, is Me Too gone too far? I hate that expression, but uh, when you're writing about these stories, the big criticism is that Me Too robs the accused person of due process. Um, but a lot of these claims never reach the, the threshold of, of criminal allegations. Right. Um, and so it's kind of like, what are you supposed to do if you know uh, for the, for these these women? To, um, if there isn't a mechanism necessarily to come forward, media is, is one is one way. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are your thoughts on the, on this idea of the due process question with Me Too, and especially as, as someone who writes about these stories, how you kind of tackle that? You know, the, I found hearing these conversations play out, there's like a very obvious crowd pleasing answer to that, which is something about how you know, for so long women weren't heard, mm -hmm. and you know, we are just now beginning to grapple with these kinds of hard truths. And the what about is some of them turning around and saying, well, what about the guys is premature. Um, and there's a lot of ways to articulate that that sort of you know, goes down a storm and people love that, particularly in a, a liberal crowd that cares about human rights issues. And all those things are true, but I think at the same time, honestly, the concern is really valid. And I think about it as I report out every story. Um, there are correctly different standards in courts of law and in journalism. Uh, many of these cases are being reported in the way they are because the criminal justice system in the states, anyway, let down survivors of sexual violence and was not adequate to creating any kind of accountability or protecting others from repeat offenders. Um, and I, I think the Weinstein story actually illustrates in a pretty compelling way how good reporting can then uh, lead to criminal justice proceedings where there had been an absence of those for a long time. Uh, but I do still think, even within those different journalistic standards, that you have to think about journalistic due process. You have to think about being meticulous and fair at every turn. Um, there are times in some of these investigations where I have believed with every fiber of my being that someone was telling the truth. Um, and uh, had a, a claim that you know 
it was a discretionary area where I could have run it, mm -hmm. but I've chosen not to mm -hmm. uh, because I'm being really, really careful, and I always err on the side of being conservative. And you know, I, I think that sometimes is a, uh, a punishing maxim to stick to. I'm glad I wasn't the one that knocked my mm, mic. I'm a mess. You can't bring me yeah, anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that that is sometimes punishing. I think that uh, when you look at a story like the Deborah Ramirez story, where we were so kind of sober in our tone and so careful about disclosing every single caveat, I think that's the correct approach. I think you owe it to anyone who's accused to really lay out any counter argument that they present. If you look at any of the stories, the Weinstein story, the Les Moonves story, the Schneiderman story, there is paragraphs and paragraphs of rebuttals in there. Um, and any fact that's on the side of the accused is aired very, very fully and explored. And if, if that makes it um, more complicated for the public to digest, and if that gets weaponized in a political context, that's sad, but you still ultimately have to give the readers that credit and err on the side of fair and conservative. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear you say this um, because I, I don't think people we're talking about it enough because there is that sort of like maybe political pressure to, to give that kind of stock answer. I actually find, you know, um, Me Too journalism has been really like quite conservative. It's the same as, you know, if you're writing about someone uh, who's committing a fraud, um, you would want the same kind of the thresholds and, and, you know, would you run a story just based on one allegation without any corroborating details at all, even if you really believe them, would that threshold fly if it was a different um, type of allegation? And it sounds like you're saying that sometimes you just can't get there if, if you don't have that, that stuff for publication. Yeah, you, you always have to be wet, ready as a reporter to scrap the reporting if there are serious doubts presented about it. I mean, I had a case uh, a couple of weeks ago where a very high profile political source um, suddenly wanted to meet and I actually was just getting on a plane to Los Angeles and it was too late to get off and I literally like got off of that flight and got on another flight back to New York and did this meeting and um, there was a claim about something that would have been a huge story, uh, you know, would have dominated the news cycle for a week uh, and had a material effect on like multiple investigations that are going on. And I had this very emphatic primary claim from someone who was in the room uh, that a thing had happened. And I just, you know, I think a lot of publications would have gone with that. And I couldn't shore it up to the exact extent that I wanted. Because it, it, there's so much on the line. You get there's one, so one on wrong, and it's, and it's over. And, and I'm not in the business of creating a big, sexy headline. I'm in the mm. business of, of trying to find the truth and trying to inform the public so they can make better decisions about their world. And um, as much as that was a really interesting story, and I had drafted it and was prepared to go with it, uh, the moment there was any kernel of doubt, I feel very good about the fact that I just shelved that for the time being. And I feel like people don't know that journalists routinely, routinely do that. And it's, you know, you, you go have a drink with your editor and you, you swear a little bit, but you yep. ultimately sleep really well. That's You're like, exactly I'm glad right. we didn't do that. Yep. Um, how do you pick what story um, and, to and do? And that, that is why I would add, you have this situation now where those new platforms we've talked about with all those delightful, polite people screaming at us have also created an environment where you see kind of extreme voices on either side um, just putting out stories. And you know, you see attempts that fall flat. Uh, I, I won't give specifics, but you can all think of recent examples. Uh, and people see through them. And the press does a great job of descending on those and then saying, hey, here's why maybe we should wait a second. Uh, but it's just very important to draw the distinction and not conflate the people who are put forward by sort of um, the hardline activists, uh, the stories that are disseminated by those, as opposed to the ones that are carefully vetted by publications that you trust. How do you pick which stories to, you must just, your inbox must just be like the most depressing you Subject can help line. make my inbox a living hell. Yeah. Send me any tips you have, yeah. seriously. No, send me the tips you have. <laughs> Canada on this side, it's Canadian. <laughs> I, yeah. How quickly you forget, she is the one who said all your facts belong to me and you can't do anything about it. 
I updated I will it on take my your call Twitter in while the middle we of the night, as we established. I will take your call in the extra middle of the night. <laughs> but so how do you pick? So there's no simple answer to that. Uh, there's the, just the practical limitations for one thing. I don't think people fully understand that you know, I have an open tip line inbox. My New Yorker email address is just, it gets several hundred story tips a day. And this is not a complaint. This is an extraordinary, wonderful position to be in as a reporter, obviously. Um, but there's also just the practical matter of it takes me a while to sift through them. Like, it takes a couple of days for me to get back to people sometimes. So hang in there. Try me again if I don't get to. Um, and I've been doing all of this totally solo up until like two weeks ago. I just started hiring for my next TV deal for HBO. So I now have a couple of research You also assistants. have an HBO. I forgot to mention that, too. The Stay tuned. PhD, though, yeah. I've, I've not, as it turns out, been totally exiled from television. Mm -hmm. uh, so God bless them. HBO is bankrolling like a couple of people to help me sift through the leads. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so there's a practical side of that answer, which is like I'm setting up more infrastructure to, to vet and pick. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of pre-interview and assess. Uh, the, the substantive answer is, you know, you're looking at what can significantly advance the conversation. Because I'm only one person, and there's only so much I can do. And there's an odd conversation about my reporting now, um, which is mostly an honor to see, but also, I think, misunderstands who I am and what I do. You know, people get mad that I'm not covering things. Right. I see a lot of it, and you probably get this too. People are like, you know, well, why aren't you? You haven't said a thing about this thing X. And, um, and I get the frustration, but I, I'm a person, you know, and there's X number of hours in the day and, uh, and only so many things I can do. And so I do have to pick carefully, and I try to pick on the basis of what is going to most significantly expand our understanding and advance our dialogue about something really important that affects the greatest number of people possible. Um, and then beyond that, then you look at kind of the bones of the story, as we always all are as investigative reporters. You know, what degree of evidence is there? Um, how compelling is the source that's bringing it to you? But uh, I wish I had time to pursue every single claim. And the fact that I'm not reporting a story doesn't mean it's not important. Uh, there's also a category of story that I think is really important, but I just know I won't have the time to look at. And in a lot of cases, what I've taken to doing is I actually I pass a lot of stories to other reporters that I respect. And, and one of the wonderful things about this profession that I've found is there's a fair amount of that that goes on. Um, I have literally, in some cases, called a beat reporter who I've never met before. Um, I should say, to give this guy a hat tip, I once called the crime reporter at the LA Times who I had never met, never had any contact with, and was basically like, look, I'm looking at this specific case. Do you know anyone on the force? Like, do you have any sources amongst the detectives that might have dealt with this thing? And he, he gave me like, you know, three different leads to, to look at. And no reporter has to do that, but I really make an effort to every time I have the chance, um, whether that's handing off stories to people that I, I trust and know will do a good job with them, or helping a competitor like, I, I was a source in one of the Times stories about Weinstein at one point. Um, <laughs> uh, just because, like, those are good reporters, and ultimately we're all in this together. Yes, we're all in this for the truth, Out, outside of the bubble. Realize how much we agonize over, uh, there's nothing worse than seeing a, a story and knowing it needs to be told, but just you don't have the resources to do it. Yes, and it, it's really heartening to me that there are enough people out there doing good work that there's usually someone I can pick up the phone and call. Maybe you, Robin. <laughs> hey, man. Well, North of the 49th. That's uh, mutual. Give me, give me some. Yeah. Good okay. Good. Um, I, I want to uh, to switch really quickly to audience questions. How are you guys doing? Does anyone need a stretch? Do you want a seventh inning stretch? Are we good? Like ten minutes of questions. Ten minutes of questions. Okay, great. First one, uh, Blair Kerrigan um, asked a question that I was going to ask you, and then I saw it, and I was like, I'll just wait. Has your uh, notoriety helped you gain access during the investigative process, or has it presented obstacles? Do people freak out when it's like it's Ronan Farrow? <laughs> I, yeah, there was like there was a, a Halloween costume that some company was selling online of like incoming call, maybe Ronan Farrow. <laughs> <laughs> And the caption on the website was like, it's the scariest costume. <laughs> the, 
the answer is overwhelmingly it has helped, I'm relieved to say. Uh, I think people, despite all of this partisan BS flying around, I think people by and large understand that I am in this for one thing and one thing only, which is a big true story. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, people across the political spectrum do come to me with really tough uh, claims that require a lot of complicated investigation. And I think that, that to the extent that there's a public profile, um, you know, it helps people understand that I have a track record for doing that sort of thing. So mostly it's a really good thing. It helps people find me. It helps me find stories. Uh, when I then need to uh, like browbeat people into talking. Uh, if they know something about a story, uh, it gives me a little extra pull. Uh, the, I say that it's mostly on that side rather than completely on that side because it is also true that people freak out when I call. <laughs> uh, Can you give me an example of someone freaking out when you call? Oh, I definitely have people who I just say my name and they hang up. <laughs> You know, but the thing is, there's all these, it's like it's become this running joke in the States, like, uh, you know, like SNL will do jokes about it, or like there was a South Park episode <laughs> where like, you know, Cartman is constantly threatening to call Ronan Farrow. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, the va if you happen to get a call from me, the vast majority of my calls are not like, I have some terrible information about you. It's like, <laughs> hey, you may know something about something, can you help? And I don't really ambush people. It's interesting. There's, there's a very different type of journalism, which I think when we sort of envision like a, like a tough interview or something, this is what we think of, like the ambush. Mm -hmm. And I've done that as like a, sort of a, you know, a thankless and, and uh, you know, generic TV reporter. I've like run after politicians on the uh, American Capitol and uh, you know, thrust mics into their face. Uh, there was that Washington Post story recently by Ben Terrace, a uh, fantastic reporter, where he quoted Kellyanne Conway as saying, like, put that on background. She was, she was disparaging her husband. <laughs> she was, because he's always tweeting against Trump, and she said I something love that like, about you know. them, though. They're fun. Oh, yeah. To I mean. I like on, the, on that front, on that front. <laughs> to totally. I love that. It seems like a fantastic relationship. <laughs> uh, but she was like, you know, uh, I just can't believe that you know so someone would uh, would go against their wife in that way. It's such a betrayal. Attribute that to a source familiar with the relationship. <laughs> and he, and he was like, you can't do that afterwards. Like we're on the record. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's amazing. We live in an amazing time. And there's nothing wrong with that journalistically, but it's actually completely alien to what I do. I in these stories, as supposedly scary as they are, I don't really ambush people. Um, people say all kinds of self-incriminating things that I don't run. Um, I give people a lot of kind of leeway in deciding uh, how their participation will happen and how it'll be used. And I think people know that I will um, respect ground rules really fastidiously and even err on the side of kind of working with them on that because it's just different than that kind of breaking news interview that I just described that that reporter Ben Terrace was doing. You know, it's, these investigations often take months and months and you really have to work with sources in them. Um, so I guess all I'm saying is in some ways it's not that scary. Right. <laughs> I need to look up that story, I missed that one. Um, do you think it's possible that uh, Mr. Weinstein will escape the consequences of his behavior, Audrey Devlin? Uh, from from a criminal Devlin. standpoint, I mean, I, I would say that there have already been very material consequences. I mean, I, I think one of the reasons I kept going, even as all that was coming down on me, was it, it was apparent to me that this was a public safety issue and that there were, you know, young women being sent to work for him and he was in a position of power where um, he could still abuse that power. And it really did appear to be a pattern that was um, both numerous and recent. So I think in that respect, he is now someone who um, has been neutralized as like a public safety risk to a, a really significant extent. In terms of the criminal justice proceedings, uh, you know, part of what I reported on most deeply was claims that the, the DA's office was corrupt in New York and um, inexplicably didn't pursue charges when they had a recording of him admitting to a sexual assault, which I later obtained. Um, 
there was a lot of talk from sources around Weinstein and the DA's office that there was some kind of a promise that they'd destroy that evidence. Obviously, it survived. Uh, I, I wrote an entire article about this chummy relationship between Weinstein's lawyers and the people at the DA's office and the fact that his two main lawyers had contributed to the DA's campaign. Uh, and shortly before they made that decision to drop the charges and that he hired firms that were specifically staffed by former members of the DA's office um, in order to neutralize those claims and kind of throw a lot of dirt on the woman bringing forward that particular allegation. Uh, the, the history does not inspire confidence, is what I would say. And I have not been surprised to see the same dynamic playing out with an incredibly aggressive legal defense on Weinstein's side um, and a lot of dysfunction on the New York DA's office side. There's a deep rift between the cops and the DA in New York. Um, you know, I think a lot, probably especially here on the other side of the border, um, it's hard to understand the distinction, but these are totally different entities, the actual... Well, we, we don't have elections either for, for DAs. See, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> That would solve a lot of I will this. say, if you call a DA in the US, they'll talk to you as a journalist, which is great. And in Canada, everyone's like, oh, I don't know, I'm at Tim Hortons. I can't really pick up the phone. <laughs> uh, I really do need to go to Tim Hortons before I leave. You do. We'll do it after. Um, OK, I want to go to uh, Monica Viktorova. Um, do you think the recent pattern of men suing their accusers introduces um, uh, a financial problem that will roll back gains women have made in speaking out through Me Too. So there's obviously been this the case of the uh, the shitty media men list, um, the, uh, Moira Donegan being sued in Canada. We've had a very high profile case of an author here, Stephen mm. Galloway, um, suing uh, a number of women. Um, as, as a journalist, is something like I worry about. That yeah. What if someone's going to sue my source but not me? Because mm -hmm. I want them to sue me because the Globe pays for me. <laughs> well, yeah. We got a. <laughs> is this something that is this happening in the United States? Is this the concern? So that's interesting. I mean, my my reading of the fact pattern has just been different. Like I, what I've seen overwhelmingly is that my sources have not been legally threatened in the ways that they feared. Um, even those who you know breached various NDAs, um, which is a pretty high number of you know, you're talking dozens of sources who breached NDAs across all these different political stories, sexual violence related stories. Uh, I haven't seen anyone get sued. Uh, I, I am very concerned about the climate of leaker prosecutions in the United States. Uh, you know, I've, I've had people come forward. The story I, I broke about Michael Cohen's financial records, for instance, that's a, that's a source who uh, participated and leaked some documents knowing that it could carry years of jail time. And I think sincerely was trying to perform a public service in doing so, and there can be reasonable disagreement about whether that source achieved that. But I do think that there should be um, an attitude of forbearance on the part of the government in cases like that, where someone is leaking earnestly to try to contribute positively to the public mm. discussion. And we have seen a steady increase in leaker prosecutions under Obama, and then vastly more so under Trump. And, and now Trump wants to open up libel laws. Yeah. So that's bad and scary. <laughs> yeah. uh, last question. God help her. Hannah Alper. I'm 15, and I want to be a journalist when I'm older. Yes. I love these questions. I What's do, too. What's your advice? Hannah, yes. wherever you are, thank you. Where's Hannah? Is Hannah in the crowd Where's here? Hannah? There's Hannah. I see Hannah in the middle. Hey, Hi, Hannah. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> Hannah, thank you for coming. <laughs> I am so grateful every time I hear from a young person that they want to do this. And I hope all of our talk about how difficult and dangerous it can sometimes be doesn't dissuade you from that. It's such important work. It's so fulfilling. I'm so grateful every time I have the chance to expose something meaningful um, to help amplify a voice that isn't being heard. Um, I wouldn't do anything else in the world. And You've done I, everything else in the world. <laughs> I, right, I know because I've tried yeah. uh, literally all the things. Uh, and, and the fact is what I see out there right now is uh, a, a wonderful set of people doing this that I'm inspired by, yourself included, uh, and also a need for more of it. 
So I hope you do that, and I hope you're the answer to that quandary of how do we go forward and how do we break more of these stories and how do we hold the powerful accountable. Um, what it's going to take is more people like Hannah saying, yeah, I'm going to do this thing too. It's a hassle, but it's really worth it. Ronan, it was so lovely and amazing to have you here. It's worth the parking tickets some of you might get. That's what you get for driving in Toronto. That's too bad. Um, I do want to now welcome to the stage the President and Executive Director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation, Natalie Turby. Well, uh, this has been a superb hour of discussion. On behalf of the Canadian Journalism Foundation and the entire audience, I'd like to thank Ronan Farrow for joining us in Toronto and for sharing with us his most precious resource, his time. Thank you. We are, we're, so, we're so thrilled we could honor you in person for being a tireless defender of the vulnerable and voiceless, your brave sources. We all benefit from your courage, your tenacity, and your journalistic integrity. Thank you again for being here. Uh, I'd also like to thank another uh, journalistic dynamo, Robin Doolittle. Her own... <laughs> Her own investigative work is making a difference in Canada, changing lives and the status quo, and we are so honored she could lead tonight's discussion. Uh, for more than 25 years, the CJF has been working for better journalism. Our motto, as journalism goes, so goes democracy, feels more relevant than ever in these challenging and unpredictable times. And part of our mandate is this public speaker series, where we explore the challenges facing the industry, and we highlight the power of journalism to hold the world around us accountable. We have two terrific events coming up to close our season, and we hope you'll join us. On November 8th, Suzanne Craig, yet another journalistic powerhouse, is in Toronto. She's a fellow Canadian, and she's here to talk about how Trump got rich and the story behind her massive investigation published last month in the New York Times. And on November 29th, we have a Canadian exclusive, a book launch with venerable former editor of The Guardian, Alan Rusberger, who's here in Toronto to talk about his biggest stories with The Guardian, think Edward Snowden and phone hacking, and about his new book, Breaking News, and what it means to journalism in North America and globally. You can have a look at our social media for details on these upcoming events. The CJF's work would not be possible, and we could not make a difference without the generous and dedicated support of our sponsors, many of whom are with us tonight. Through your contributions, we can advance the dial on news literacy in Canada, and we can offer important fellowships and awards for Indigenous journalists, journalists shedding light on women's equality issues, and valuable internships for emerging investigative journalists with the hope to inspire the future Ronan Farrows and Robin Doolittles. I want to thank uh, the Globe and Mail, our media partner for tonight's talk, and our thanks again to Accenture Canada, a longtime CJF supporter and our sponsor tonight. To close out the program, please join me in welcoming Teresa Ebden. She's a former journalist and uh, director of media and analyst relations with Accenture. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, and Robin, and David, for leading such an incredible evening. And thank you so much, Ronan, for sharing your incredible views. Thanks, everyone, for joining this evening. I can see by your faces that you're as moved as I am by our speaker tonight. Now it's up to all of us to ask ourselves, what are we going to do with what we heard tonight? There is a saying we like at Accenture, one that our Prime Minister likes to quote from, from Graham Wood. Change has never happened this fast before, and it will never be this slow again. Ronan Farrow is the ultimate disruptor in driving change because he pursues the truth. It is expensive, it is hard, and it takes courage, and it doesn't happen without support. The very best thing so we can do tonight is to be inspired to continue to read and pay for the works of journalists like Ronan Farrow and then use what we learn to make decisions to build the kind of world that we all want to live in, in our organizations, 
our communities, our schools, our places of worship, and among our family and friends. We must support and subscribe to news organizations that are giving change agents like Ronan Farrow the platform to tell us what we didn't know that we needed to know. Which is all to say, that's why it's important to me and to all of us at Accenture to support the Canadian Journalism Foundation. We do all that we can to foster the kind of ethical, respectful, and egalitarian world that we want to live and work in today. And finally, a big thank you to all of you for coming out tonight to support the CJF. As their mission statement says, and as Natalie just said, as journalism goes, so goes democracy. Thank you both for coming out to support, thank you for coming out to support both tonight. Good night.